Good morning uh, to everyone from Bangkok and good afternoon for those in Europe. I am Lia Shortino. I am the director of C Junction, and C Junction is a public venue in Bangkok that focuses on Southeast Asia, all kinds of uh, emergence and current issue related to this uh, region. And one of the team that we have given particular attention is migration in various collaboration with various organizations, including my own university, the Institute for Population and Social Research of Maidon University. But today we have uh, a collab another collaboration with the Global Alliance Against Trafficking in Women. And this is a series, a particular series of events that focus on the European Southeast Asian corridor. So migration from uh, Southeast Asia to Europe in all its various form. Particularly today, we focus on the Philippines and migration of Philippine women to Europe and particularly of two uh, receiving country, Germany and England. So we will uh, start with our speaker from the United Kingdom uh, which is uh, Chrisana, uh, Marissa, sorry, Marissa, and uh, she is from the Voice of Domestic Worker, and she will share about the experience of her own organization as well as some other information about uh, migration of Philippines to uh, the UK. Please, Marissa. Um, so, sorry, your mic is my. Yeah, thank you so much, Rosalia. I'm uh, Marisa Bigonia. I'm a domestic worker myself. I am a mother of three, and I'm the founding member and director of the self-help group, The Voice of Domestic Workers. It's a community of migrant domestic workers. Uh, we educate, we campaign, we empower ourselves to be to be able to stand up and voice out and also uh, to rebuild our one shattered life and how we support each other is very much uh, important to, to what we do. And we've been established since uh, March 2009, so we're kind of 14 years already of community organizing and, and campaigning and advocating for to make a change in the lives of many migrant domestic workers. So I think I could explain what the topic today through my own story, because I, of me being a migrant domestic worker myself and my journey. So I uh, left my own country in the, from the Philippines in 2004, my children were just one, two, three years old and ages that they needed a mother most. But I was in a country where it's hard to, to, to provide for the needs of my children. And walking around the street of Metro Manila made me and frightened me all the time because there were so many children begging in the street. I look at my own children and I told myself, I don't want my children to be begging in the street. And hearing them crying, not being able to, to give them what they are asking maybe it's just an ice cream, maybe just at the time one peso, which I couldn't even buy them. And for a mother, I think it's, it's painful, you know, to, to see your children wanted one thing and you couldn't give it. And plus the fact you are worried of the future of what about if they are sick? How could I afford the hospitalization? So it, it's it's frightening, and I needed to do something, you know, to to prepare so that my children couldn't be in in that situation. I don't want to wait until they are hungry. So at the time, I think the the fastest way to be able to 
to provide for that is to to work abroad and i think at that time also is is the most common that most women would do yeah to 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 work abroad so i apply in the agency the first country that i i been to was singapore in 1994 and uh at that time i think i I actually didn't know what is going to happen to me abroad because you will see the news, a domestic worker came home in a coffin. You could see the news, right, so many rape victims. So it, it was scary, but also it was the most painful decision of my life, especially my children were just one to three years old. And, but, you, I was faced with uh, with the situation of of a kind of death and survival, and both for me and my children. Am I going to survive abroad? What will happen to my children without me beside them? So you, it's really a tough decision. But somehow, somewhere, you you have to do something, and I I got the courage to to do what is needed to be done. Maybe I think it's 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 motherhood. Is a mother could do anything for her children, no matter what difficult that decision, that life in front or ahead of of me. So yeah, so I I, I went to Singapore. I worked there for five years, but the distance was really hard, you know, like I could see, hear my children crying every night. I was holding the picture that I slept, you know, and I put it in my heart and then it's fall asleep crying, you know, like I couldn't eat. I needed um, glasses of water to, to swallow it, you know. So I need to survive no matter what. If I die, I always have that. What will happen to my children if I die? So I have to survive for my children. And I'm hoping in my heart also my children survive. So, Because I think it's the sacrifice of both, you know, as an OFW, but also the children are making sacrifices of you being away from them. So, but but the situation wasn't really good. The salary was not enough to sustain for me to be able to give them the, the life that I wanted for them. And um, and then and the, the distance also at that time, there was no technology, yeah? So you, you, on your day off, you have to write letter and many months would arrive to them and then they write back to you. Many months will arrive to you, so in that situation. So I wanted, to, to bring them to Manila so I could at least call them, talk to them. I don't want them to grow up not knowing me that they have a mother. So so I decided to work in, in Hong Kong. And then um, there at least I had a day off every, every week. But, you know, being a domestic worker is you face with so many difficulties. You know, I, I experienced being... I'm not being directly beaten, but you know the the shouting, you know the verbal abuse that you hear that one, and then uh, at times maybe I you would I would put up with the abuse because I needed to pay some money to the agency to the loan that you, you we use, you know to, we were forced to loan to be able to get out of the country, and by that time we managed to get out, we're already drowning in debt. And then uh, you don't want this loan shark to attack your children back home. So you you had to, to pay back, you know, as soon as you could. So but I think you you these are the, the danger, you know, that you you we we, we face. But also uh, I experienced being uh, sexually harassed, you know, like your employer asking you to massage. And um, you're alone, you luck in, in private household. So, to many, I think it's the most, uh, it's the most 
maybe safest place because it's a family in a home that you're working, but at times you are alone with your male employer, you're taking advantage, who look at you like, um, like a, a sex object, you know. And to see my employer naked in bed, it's like, I'm in a room wherein I couldn't even jump out the window because that is a high rise building, yeah? And I, if I jump, I die. It's a place wherein I couldn't scream for help because no one could hear me. So it's, it's the one that I was reading in the newspaper is I was in that situation. So I just say, you know what, sir? I read in that massage book that you gave me. This is the most uh, effective way to massage. So I was angry the way I was treated, you know, as a sex object. But also, I needed to find a way to save myself. You know, I didn't go out and sacrifice so much to, to just to be raped, you know, and to just... Uh, but at the same time, I feel the anger that I wanted so much to fight back. So I think I could think that way to save myself, you know, on how I hardly really massage on how important it is to find a way of self-defense, you know, so that you won't be raped, you won't be touched. So, yeah, so that's why I didn't say it. Much very pain. I say the more pain, the more good. Let's do it again. So I was really angry. So it was hard, really. You, yeah. So and then so get out. So but you are. I'm still in the household where in you know no escape because that door is locked. And so I had to get knife, you know, to protect myself. So you can see why domestic workers maybe in the news that they're killing their employees is absolutely not. They are forced to do that, to defend herself. I think you hear the story of Jennifer Darkes, yeah, who, who attacked her employer because she was about to be raped by this employer. So the employer died and she was sentenced to death, you know. And that's the reason why I pick up the case and campaign against the death penalty of Jennifer Darkes. And as you can see, I think you may know aware of this, that she was freed, yeah. So the Voice of Domestic Workers campaign for this uh, case, because it's something that I relate so much that I was in that situation, I managed to save myself, and then I say, sir, you open the door, let me go. So he opened the door, he said, I'm sorry, I say, you have been doing this to my fellow domestic workers, you know what you're doing, you know that this is a crime, and you know I'm going to talk outside that, but open the door now. I will really not hesitate to, to kill you. Yeah, so he opened the door and let me go. So th these are the situations that many people, I think, aren't aware what's happening really out inside the household to many domestic workers. You just look at the, high, high, the headline, domestic worker killed, domestic worker, blah, blah, blah. But Behind the story, the only thing really that it come out is uh, that domestic worker is able to speak out, able to have the courage to talk about it. And this is why um, exactly what brought me to the, the community that I'm working uh, with and um, that I set up the organization, you know, to I'm just taking you to, to my charity uh, day, to the community that we set up, because I think I also escaped coming to the UK. Yeah? So I came in the UK via overseas domestic worker visa. So it's not really an open, yeah, open widely you know I needed to work in an employer to for at least a year to be for my employer to be able to bring me here in the UK and that's that's the rule and uh, my employer in Hong Kong was coming to UK for good so they brought me with them in the UK so that's how I 
I I managed to to come in the UK. It's not an open door. It's the is the air conditions uh, need to be to be done by the employer. Your contract of one year contract or over. Yeah, you need to show that and pass the the money that your the employer should be able to afford. To, to pay us according to the national minimum wage in the UK. So uh, upon having those experiences, I thought I was the only one uh, being in that situation at that time. And but having escaped because of so many different abuse that I suffered from my employer who brought me here in the UK, which include very long hours of work. We're talking about 16 to 24 hours of work, especially you're, you're looking after children. You're constantly sleeping with them. They had to wake up whenever they wake up as well. So it's a 24 hours of work. And plus, the, the salary is not really according to the national minimum, which as the law says here in the UK required so more often they sign a contract which is actually very different from the actual salary that we are receiving so like i've been promised of 700 pounds per week but uh 700 pounds per month so in my mind oh my gosh that's too big already yeah i mean i was in Hong Kong thinking of that money but because uh, I, I didn't know what's really the national minimum wage here in the UK, what should be the salary. And then here comes my employer will say that, oh, we will deduct 300 pounds for your food and accommodation because that's, that's the rule in the UK, that's the law. So uh, yeah, I believe because that's, that's what they're telling me. So, so yeah, and, and coming in the UK where we don't really hold our passport, employers are holding our passport. So, and then, so it's hard for us to really escape. And then plus they will tell you that, oh, you don't talk to anyone because um, you will be arrested by police. It's, it's against the law to, to be chatty, to be talking to anyone in the UK. So you, you, you're, you're in the private household, you have no access to outside world. So you, you believe everything. Or when you see the police, try to get away from police because they will, uh, they will attack you, yeah? So, uh, okay. Uh, so I've seen my fellow domestic workers in my eyes. Uh, I witness everything, all the different forms of which I realize worse than me. You know, like we, we have been so great victim, being scalded by hot water, being beaten. You see all those bruises, and then we realize the need for us to to group together. To, to to organize ourselves to be able to fight back to defend ourselves and and eventually um uh, stand up campaign to make the the better protection and rights for migrant domestic workers here in the UK. So yeah so we've been doing community organizing campaigning and advocacy to 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 change the lives of migrant domestic workers. So we have all these classes every Sunday and Saturday evening. Some of them are online, but <clears throat> the main are Made in Mind Wellness Workshop and also IT Computer and ESOL class. Yeah. So the rest are online because we couldn't fit it all in one Sunday. If we could, then why not? But so, so the others are online, like financial, media com, and uh, financial. So we also have this special training to, to train them to be a public speaker. So we have this future voices, but also employment rights for them to equip themselves to, to fight back, to, 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 to lobby for better work conditions that they should be able to do it without the help of solicitor. Yeah. So we have the participatory in, uh, reintegration research, which is coming up very soon. Uh, so these are all our services. I think we rescue means uh, any domestic workers can contact us to if there's something happening bad to them, then we will go and uh, take them out of that household. So wherever they're coming from, even as far as Scotland, we, we do rescue. 
So we have counseling, we provide temporary uh, accommodation, yeah, and job referrals. And NRM, I'll see you later. So, so far, uh, we, what I had, what rights I had, that's why I was able to, to rebuild my life is because there were rights in place in the UK. So I could change employer, I could renew my visa, I could settle, and now I'm British citizenship. All these were scrapped in 2012. So domestic workers were uh, left undocumented, which really, I think, what really uh, exploited them more is because the absence of all these rights. So like now the domestic workers have no rights in the UK. Yeah, so they are only a six months visa for private household, but also for diplomat, they have longer visa, two to five years, yeah. Uh, so in 2016, during the Modern Slavery Act review, the right to change employer were incited, but without the right to renew the visa. So it's also useless, no use at all, yeah. So because they also ended up being documented. So, but in 22, we won the national minimum wage for live-in domestic workers, which we are currently uh, lobbying the government to implement it because they already promised that they're gonna do it. And the way forward for domestic workers is to, to, to apply a national referral mechanism of the trafficking law. So this is designed by Media Class. So this is through their own journey in the national referral mechanism of trafficking law. So they made this in the class, which is really impressive. Uh, so being in the national referral mechanism, they need to pass into positive reasonable grant. That's the first decision and then followed by conclusive grant decision alongside with the discretionary leave to remain. So after this, if they pass all that, then they will have the two years of a systematic worker visa, but this is the dead end again. So it's not really good. It's not for domestic workers. We always say that domestic workers are not victims, not slaves, not family members, but workers. So they, here they are being identified as victims of modern slavery and trafficking, which is opposite to what they are. Well, we recognize that, that there are domestic workers who are truly trafficked, but it's just a small number, but majority of them are really uh, victims. I, I, workers. So because they came here with proper visa, with proper work, with proper contract and so on. Yeah. So they just they remove all those rights in 2012. So that's I am unable for them to access the employment rights, regardless what the UK say that they all do have uh, right uh, access to employment rights, but without the right to renew the visa, how could they access that? So uh, so we work with, uh, as I'm also sitting as vice chair in the European uh, Food, Food, European Federation of Food, Agriculture, Tourism, and the fourth sector of that is domestic work. And I'm sitting as vice chair. They have the, also their campaign to, 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 I think this also lead to the ratification of ILO Convention 189, this and work for domestic workers. I think this very much aligned with UK law because domestic workers are not really uh, included in the health and safety protection of the government. Now, it is important for us in our campaign work that we work with trade unions. Uh, we have this International Domestic Workers Federation, which is why we are also member. We work with uh, many NGOs. I only put Kalaya, but there are so many NGOs, flags uh, at Leo. But also I think the importance of uh, working with uh, Global Alliance, uh, against traffic women was also a long, a long time partnership with Global, which I think important on how they like they brought us to, to lobby for in Geneva, in United Nations in Geneva for the um to, to review the 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 whether the work of UK aligned with the with the human rights. Yeah. So we we have done so many work with with W, but also uh, they supported us in our financially funded us in our advocacy work, but also we also had research, which we, I think you can see and publish it. It is published by GATW in the website. You can find it there. So we continue our campaign to reinstate the rights of migrant domestic workers to give back what the domestic workers 
uh, have. So we always say that domestic workers are workers and domestic work is work. It is the work, it is the fuel of the economy that allow other workers to be able to, to, to work and, and that's how the economy function. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for sharing your experience as well as the key point of your advocacy at this point of time for domestic worker to be recognized as a worker. Uh, we go now to the other speaker, uh, Risanta. Uh, she is also the leader of one organization. Uh, I am afraid, uh, Jiban Bajing. Banying. It's a Thai. It's a Thai phrase called House of Women. Okay, so oh Ba'an. Okay, so it's uh, different. But okay, please. So please share uh, about the situation in uh, Germany. I understand you are. Okay, thank you. I am Krisanta Tegeyamanish. I am a um, language and cultural mediator at Banying Counseling Center against human trafficking, and we also have a shelter. Specifically, we cater for Filipinas and Thai women and also victims of human trafficking and household workers of diplomats. I would uh, like to request a bomb to show the PowerPoint. Okay, thank you. So on the second slide, Thank you. So uh, I would like today I we will talk I will talk about the women the Filipinas that we interviewed during our GATW research project because um, this time since Corona it has changed a lot also the profile of women who are coming here since there has been some laws passed and are still being passed now there are skilled workers law in which um, a lot of more uh, women also come here even with their families. Uh, like for example, in the, uh, there are some who are IT specialists. Before there were only, uh, okay, I'll just start with the profile now. So mo most of those that we interviewed are between 25 and 70 years old. And since three to 40 years in Germany, they migrated due to work, like uh, what uh, Marisa said most of them come as domestic workers, but not directly from the Philippines. They come through, for example, from Saudi Arabia, and then some are au pair of private uh, families and nurses. Nurses have been coming here for a long time already. And the others come here as uh, marriage migrants and also to reunite with their families. Some of them has experienced exploitation, especially at work and also domestic abuse. And then some of them are also temporarily, they're undocumented. And uh, until now, we still also counsel some women who are still undocumented. And uh, it's really quite hard because also of the German laws and policies. But there is a commission in Berlin, in, Berlin, in Germany called Hertfall. It's called Hard Cases, Hard Cases Commission which really take care of them, but it depends also on the grounds, like for example, humanitarian grounds, for example, one single woman who has a child and she has to stay here because for example, the child needs medical care. So it all depends on what grounds the person has to offer. And even when she is, has been living uh, un undocumented for a long, long time. For most of their residence permits are, uh, yeah, like what I said, based on humanitarian grounds, and then also family reunion, and also temporary permit when witnesses in a trial. And for domestic workers, they have this called PP card, PP, PP ID. It's, it's just a protocol ID. It's only attached to their uh, employer as household workers, and they cannot apply for any other visa with that. And most of these women are also breadwinners and mostly also as single mothers and their children are either in the Philippines or here in Germany. Uh, next, please. Boom, thank you. So 
um, we have also main challenges. Uh, of course, the main is the language because not like in, in UK, language here is German and it is really costing them a lot of time, money and energy to, to learn the language. And especially also to, to have your visa or residence permit extended, one should really reach the level B1, which is really like the fourth level. And then also the access to the labor market. It's usually also very hard to apply here, especially if one has no qualification. And also even if one has finished a bachelor's degree or some, some uh, years in school or in the university in the Philippines, there's always this, this phase where one has to have his certific her certificates recognized so that it will have to be according to the educational system in Germany. And that is also really hard for most of, the, of our clients that we are counseling because most of them only finish high school. So they really cannot access the labor market where they could really earn more. So it's also hindering them in their economic growth. And then the next one also, uh, the authorities uh, here in Germany is very, very bureaucratic. And if you really want to have an appointment to do something with an authority, you really need to make an appointment online. An online appointment is so hard, you can easily get an appointment. It's like, for uh, for example, for a visa appointment, you, you can search for how many months and there are no there are no available appointments. And also with the authorities, you it's you all one also always receives these papers and they're all in German. And that's why most women also come to us because they don't understand what is be, being asked of them. And it's really complicated, especially if they don't have time because they work a lot and they don't have time to go to counseling. Because at the moment, also in at Banning, that's also one of the main challenges at work now. Since Corona, we cannot, we are not, our counseling every Wednesday is not open anymore. So it's really a, based on appointment. So if you have a problem in a week, you it's really hard. It's either we also have to, we try hard to answer their problems through telephone or emails, but sometimes it's, it's difficult, especially if we have to see the documents. And then also personal psychological issues. Most women, especially during the pandemic, they felt isolated. And also they, they, uh, homesickness is really also a main cause. And also, um, yeah, especially those who work in the hospitals or the home for the aged, where they also sometimes stay, it's also sometimes because of cultural background, they cannot, they cannot connect very well with their colleagues. And then, yeah, uh, wait. So um, personal psychological, yeah, because they are concentrated on earning money. So they also don't have social life. So that's what I'm uh, like, that's why it affects also their, their uh, emotional condition, their psychological condition. So even when they have a lot of problems at work, they cannot bring it out and they don't have an outlet for it. And also for, for example, partners and family, there are some who, um, for example, nurses, uh, both of them are nurses. It's even, especially outside of Berlin, it's quite hard for them to look for uh, caretakers for their small children. So one has to, to be absent at work to take care of the child. And, and so other than taking care of themselves, they also have to take care of the needs of the partner and when, for example, the husband cannot get also other jobs. So it's also difficult. And even if they have to get their family here, they also need to pass a lot of requirements so that they can get their family with them to Germany. So racism and discrimination, that's already quite uh, understandable. And it's still difficult even when someone is also earning on her own. It's still always, there's still always this um, how they look at Asians, for example, if a woman, if an Asian has a German child, some uh, some people will say, always say you're just staying here so that you can get the kindergarten or the child support, financial support. So it's really um, even when, um, that's why 
most Filipinas, they really work hard. They have a lot, uh, they have two to three different kind of small jobs, uh, mini jobs, are, it's called mini jobs, because that's the only way that they could earn money. And these mini jobs, they are allowed only for like 450 hours a week to uh, a month, a month to work. And from this, it's also optional to pay for pension because they, are, they cannot qualify for better jobs. And these jobs I will tell on the other slide. Next, please. Yeah, so that's why we were trying hard for their inclusion to give them support. And that's why Banning, in Banning we offer counseling support. Uh, but the problem is it's, it's really difficult also to reach out to them, especially during the pandemic. Some of them were like, for example, were under stress because they are losing jobs. Or that, or they had to concentrate on their jobs that they cannot uh, come to us anymore for their problems. They cannot take care of anything else, and also, for example, domestic abuse. So it also affects their psychological conditions, <clears throat> especially when they also don't have social contacts. Or there, for example, during the pandemic, uh, a family member died in the Philippines. And they, it's, it, was, it was a difficult time for most women. Okay. And some of them were also, even when they have uh, work, it, uh, it was really hard for them. And it is still hard for some to come out and ask for help. So that's actually uh, uh, quite common among Filipinas to ask for help, even from their friends or from their family. And then also with their rights, we are trying hard also with Banning to give information afternoons. Since we started with GADW, we were also able to, to do a lot of information sessions, like for example, about labor rights, about pension, about marriage, about separation, divorce, child custody, because aside from work, they have a lot of other concerns in their living here in Germany. And then that's why that's uh, also one of our uh, actually challenges because when Filipinas come here, most of them don't know about their rights or duties. So that's why it's quite hard also, but with, uh, especially with the household workers in every German embassy around the globe, we have these brochures for household workers. So at least they know what changes, what rights, what duties they have once they work as domestic workers for diplomats in Germany. And then the mobility, uh, it's good at least in Germany, the, the tickets now for the trains, trams and buses are getting cheaper. And those who receive some additional financial support from the government, they, they get these special discounts so they can travel, not just in Berlin, cheaper also in the whole Germany. And then for the living conditions, uh, yeah, the German government is also, for example, the Kindergeld, the child money, child's money. Uh, those are for parents who are working, who have kids. And also, in addition, when women don't have enough money, for example, they can apply for a Bongeld. It's called Bongeld. It's additional uh, financial support so that they can pay their rent. And then for elderly women, if they don't, they did not pay enough contribution for their pension, they could apply for a Grundsicherung or basic security money so that they can at least pay their rent and buy basic needs. And then for the community, we also are trying hard to reach out to them through the Filipino community, especially here in Berlin. I've been also doing some events with the press and uh, it's an open community, even if it's a religion, uh, it's, there's a church between the, beside it. It's an open community and we do a lot of events there. And also we, we do some, for example, sports fest or some like what I will mention in the next, some art events or just some get together for them to know that there is a community where they can come and share their problems or situation in case they don't want to come to Banning or other NGOs. So, and yeah, in German society also, there are many NGOs, not just Banning, even outside of Berlin, 
especially when Filipinas live, uh, for example, in small villages outside of Germany. The problem is just, it's also quite common among Filipinas. They, they are quite shy to approach German organizations when there is no Filipina, like for me, Filipina translator. So that's why we also try hard to tell them they should uh, at least bring a friend who speaks German because uh, that's also one of the problems with Banying. We had a lot of calls during the pandemic, but we could not help them, help them because they are outside of Berlin. And some of them are also really the whole time that they've been living in the village, for example, they did not make friends. So they depended on their husbands. So they, they could not go anywhere else for support. So like what I said before, they are ashamed, they are shy, or they are afraid to ask for help. And then the language also. In Germany, in Berlin, they're also called VHS Volkshochschule or uh, schools for the, um, for the uh, member of the community where they can get, uh, where they can apply for German courses uh, uh, cheaper compared to other German class uh, schools. But then it's also uh, always a problem, especially for those who really work hard, like two to three jobs because they don't have time anymore and then they still have kids to take care. But then there are also some like called Sprach Cafe or it's called, uh, it's like a language cafe offered in, from other organizations where they can come for free and then just talk with other people in German. And then like what I said, it also costs a lot of time, money and energy, and they don't, they don't have those enough. Of, they don't have the luxury of these. And then, yeah, with the inclusion, also a family in home country, it's also a German law that they can get their family here through the family reunion visa. But uh, there are also, also very uh, a list of requirements. For example, they should have uh, this size of a flat. They should have this income so that they can get. So and also, it's it's really a lot of. Uh, they should have a work contract that's unlimited. So it's difficult for those who are just working, for example, in the cleaning industry. So most of these women who don't earn a lot, they just stay here the whole time while their family and their kids are just in the Philippines and they don't even have um, time or money to go back for vacation. But uh, yeah, it's really quite hard now. And then the political participation, like for example, Banning has a shelter and we also try hard to involve them. For example, during Women's, uh, Women's Day, International Women's Day, we go, we do some um, artwork session with them. We do some posters or some whatever about uh, women empowerment. And then we go with them for demonstration. So at least they know what's going on and what they are fighting for. What is this International Women's Day? So we also uh, like for campaigns for Labor Day. So at least we involve them for what's happening. And then in German, in Berlin also, there are organizations who are taking care of the elderly, Asian elderly. So it's not just Banying. So there are different, so once they come to us to Banying, we also send, uh, forward them to other organizations based on the needs and if Banying cannot give it to them. So the weather, Actually, it's also been it's been quite hard also with the weather, but at least it's at least it's um, I think it's a lot better for them for most of them because it's like uh, I think it's not really about weather. It's like environmental protection for them that they are now far or safe compared to what we always hear from here about floods or typhoons in the Philippines. But of course, for those who have families there, it's really difficult for them. And then also for the weather, because of course it's been changing also the energy costs here in Germany because of the war in Ukraine. There have been also some government support. If they suddenly have to pay a lot for heating costs, they also get, they can easily get from uh, financial support from the government job center, it's called job center. 
if they cannot pay, for example, the year uh, one year costs. So the they they can get a lot of support actually, uh, not a lot, but at least enough support. But the problem is just we cannot reach out to them. They cannot. They they are. Yeah, they have to come and ask because we also we are not like the embassy or other um, authorities. We especially the household workers. We don't have a list of their names, so that's why uh, that's also one of Panning's problems because we have these all these services and the information, but we cannot keep them to them. But that's why uh, uh, next, please. Uh, we, let's talk about women's suggestions first. So there are some changes in policy, self-help groups, prevention. Those are what we collected during the interviews. And then the next, please, with our advocacy work. Yeah, that's why we in Banning, since we started our, since we had our 30th anniversary in 2019, we were thinking about uh, how, how, especially in my part, as an artist, I was thinking about how, how to reach out to these women who are really in these situations. And so at least they can get our support and services. So I was starting with the art exhibit uh, with my art portraits. And the portraits are uh, showing the women from behind. And then with every, uh, because I wanted to protect their identity also, so I did not want to show their faces. And then I asked them to, to give text directly from each of them. So that's why during the research project with KW, I decided to do a second series with black and white with these women that we interviewed. And then I started exhibiting them for to raise awareness, public's awareness about the situation of women, because with this text, they were telling about what they what, what have they done, how was their situation as domestic worker, for example, as a single mother. And then I started also asking three women to share their stories live during the event. So it was also empowering for these women to really uh, uh, speak for themselves. And it's also empowering for other women listening that they can also do that. And so they are inspired to do the same. So it's like um, we don't have to always, because there are a lot of journalists coming to Banning, interviewing them, telling about their stories. And I think it's more empowering for each woman if she speaks about it herself, especially after all the trials and after surviving, for example, as a single mother working as a domestic helper, domestic worker. And then like what I said, uh, we had also a series of information sessions about job coaching for those who really needed help in how to get a job and where to look for a job and what do they need, especially for job interviews where they have to speak in German, for example. So residents permit how to, how to, because that's also one of the things that they don't know that once they've been working for a long time, like five, minimum five years, they can already apply for unlimited visa. And those are the things that they should know that they can already get an unlimited residence permit, for example, situations like that. And then labor rights, when they have problems with their contracts or anything that they don't actually know and they are still working. Like for example, there are some who never check their uh, statement of their uh, salary and they, they don't notice that some, it's quite common among nurses that some they work this and these hours, but they get paid only these hours or they then get paid overtime for their overtime work. And then the, we also had family loans and then pension or widow's pension. And then uh, next, please. Yeah, and so uh, household workers of diplomats, we do counseling and accommodation in our shelter if uh, we have a, a available bed. And then we communicate also with the all foreign affairs and negotiate with employer. And then if it did not work with negotiation, you also go to press conference. And then we connect her also with journalists, but these are all 
if the woman likes it. And yes, we have also the to do. We wanted to do some videos for household workers to reach out to them. And also one of the advocacies we wanted to demand for a one month salary advance from the employer. So in case something happens, the woman has one uh, month salary paid already. Next, please. Yeah, uh, those are just pictures of the events that took place. So the first one, when we started the art exhibit with store sharing and a film showing about the, uh, with the film, doc film called Sunday Beauty Queen. It's about domestic workers in Hong Kong. And then the second, the next one with the, also with art exhibit with the Philippine embassy. And it was also helping us to help uh, to raise the public's awareness, especially in the Filipino community about the situation of the Filipinas in Germany. So that's all, thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very comprehensive overview of uh, the situation in uh, Germany and also the activities that your organization is undertaking. So we have uh, one question uh, from uh, the participant. If for both of you, of course, in your different contexts, if you were to suggest one, only one uh, policy change, what would be the most strategic one? So in the situation in the UK and in the situation in the Germany, what is the law? policy measure that you would like uh, to change or at the least seen from the perspective of your constituency? That is uh, one uh, question. Uh, then uh, maybe for Germany, can you explain more about the small uh, jobs, why they have to do a different kind of uh, short level of jobs rather than one uh, full, uh, I think you were starting to say more about this, but then uh, I am not sure I got it. Uh, why, what is the reason why they have to have uh, multiple short uh, hour jobs? And for uh, the UK, can you tell uh, a little bit more about why the law were changed uh, about the visa? What were the reason uh, for the cancellation of those uh, more promising uh, measure and uh, now that you are advocating for going back. Maybe we start with Crisanta this time and then we go to Marisa, please. Thank you. So the question is about the mini jobs. Uh, most women choose this because uh, number one, they are not qualified for other jobs and most jobs available are just mini jobs which are these mini jobs just include usually just as helper in the supermarket or cleaning jobs, cleaning private houses or in the hospital or in office, for example. And also because with mini jobs, they don't need to pay tax, but they have a contribution for the health insurance. But then uh, the, uh, the pension, it's also just recently that they had to pay the pension. So that's why most women usually prefer that because of the, the um, it's not, yeah, it's actually a big problem. If the tax here, the tax deduction are really a lot. And yeah, like what I said, it's quite hard for them to get jobs with more hours. Yeah, so they just you take two to three mini jobs. Like what I said, these are among the women that we interviewed with the W Research Project. Okay. Uh, is yeah. the other question also for me? Yes, the, yes. yes. Okay. if you were you based on the experience and the research, if you were to suggest one uh, change in the laws, which one would be? Yeah, uh, it's been always there. What I would really like to happen is that a law would pass that when someone has a job offer with uh, enough salary, that she is allowed or given that she will be allowed to work even when she's a Filip with a Filipina passport. Because here in Germany, even when there is an employer who offers you the job, 
but then the position um, can be taken by anyone. The, it's called Agency for Workers, Employment Agency. They would say, no, this job can be taken by a German or a European, and then they will deny it so that the immigration office will also deny you a work permit. So that's really a very big problem. We have, we've had cases like that, that a Filipina, she was a household helper. And then she, we were able to get for her a job in a Filipino restaurant. And she even qualified and the employer wants her, but the employment agency said, no, a German can take that or a European. So no, she has to go back or she has to find other ways to get a residence permit. So that's what really is very, I think it's really the most important. It will be really uh, change. Uh, it will change a lot of lives actually, if that happens, because even with students, with other, there are a lot of actually, uh, especially those who work as household workers, the as cleaning in the cleaning industry, they can, they can get papers, the, the undocumented ones. Okay, now we have uh, quite a lot of questions, but first let's uh, see, Marisa, please, can you answer yeah. the previous um, question and then I will do another round. Okay, I think I answered the second question first. Uh, when I think it was uh, 1998 when the overseas domestic worker visa was implemented for the reason the UK acknowledged that uh, the most vulnerable the most vulnerable group of workers are the domestic workers. Therefore, they needed more rights. They needed more protection in place. And I would say that slavery could actually end. You know, I could see myself as a living evidence of that because when I stayed from abusive employer, I didn't even know that kind of uh, right to change employer were in place that I could uh, change, I could renew my visa. And that truly helped me rebuild my life, having that those rights in place that I could be settled in the UK. And I think way back in the Philippines, did I ever dream to be in the UK? Did I ever think that I'd be here in the UK? No, it was the em employer who brought me here and I didn't even know what life awaits me here. And um, being able to 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 change my life for better you know what that other domestic workers all truly deserve and the importance that when they are already escaping running or running for their life escaping from different forms of abuse of sexual abuse and um uh, physical abuse mental torture escaping from that being able i think it's really important to have those rights that they are able to access this and that um they could also reclaim the unpaid wages yeah so that, that's really important and have been working since 1998 there's nothing wrong with them says so and, and why fix a policy that proven the most effective, proven that's the best policy in the world that protect migrant domestic workers. It's recognized by the world. And why remove it? Yeah. So I think that will bring me to the to the to the question. And when during the, the change of government, there was a conservative and liberal Democrat government. So it was the time that uh, they did a lot of changes in the immigration rules. And one of the most really uh, hardly hit was uh, domestic workers. They were, uh, for the reason that they, the reason that they removed is uh, they need to bring down the, the from the migration from hundreds thousands to tens thousand, yeah, and and that's the political game, you know. That also, I think migrant also are uh, migrant workers are easily, you know, scapegoat of of things that uh, they've done wrong, of things that they not uh, doing the proper work of the government, I think that is, they will look at easily on, on migrant workers and using them as a scapegoat. But also, I think they use them to kind of uh, 
of uh, dividing the people, you know, the British. Oh, they're coming here to steal their, your job, you know, and that make the British people, you know, especially those who are not really politically educated, you know, are not aware of the situation. They just read the news. So, oh, they're stealing the, your job. That's why it's really difficult to find job. It's, I think domestic workers have its own place, you know. They could, uh, they could adapt, you know, they could, uh, like I think local uh, domestic workers or nannies, uh, they have their own family. So therefore they just want that eight hours job. And the needs of migrant domestic workers to be able to, to adapt to the situation, like employers will work in another country, come back maybe for a week, or they need to do the overtime. And domestic workers are there working, feeling that, that past that, in their absence but also we always say that when they are the employers are working overtime the domestic workers are also working overtime therefore you also need to acknowledge that the work should be paid and not just by in kind thank you for looking after my children thank you my i have food thank you my house is clean Thank you doesn't remit us money to our family. We love our country to be able to work. Yeah, so they are the easily targeted uh, group of workers uh, during that the time of the of the change of the government. Yeah, but I think the 1998 decision, you yeah, know, to implement the the overseas domestic workers was a cross party decision. It's not really truly government, but I think during that campaign, I think that the voice of domestic workers are also in the front line of the campaign and that leads to the and the trade unions the NGOs work together campaign providing the evidence on and what's happening to domestic workers behind a closer so on the need for them to have a better rights and protection and that was implemented and it's been working and fix it for something that, that uh and change it to, to trafficking law which truly opposite of all we always say that the overseas <coughs> domestic worker visa is actually the medicine that cured that disease that cured that trafficking so it's the prevention of trafficking and removing that the more they are exploited they're more into trying to being traffic so and that, that's the importance of the provision i think coming to the, the first question and why i would say that this is the policy that we want to be reinstated because we, we know that having that right to change employer having that right to renew the visa being settled they're paying tax and, and I, why they couldn't be settled and being a british citizen and and why others could have all those rights and why only domestic workers could have. We're in, these are the group of workers who allow everybody to be able to work. Without these workers, how could they all work? Yeah. Yes, I think it's very clear the point that trafficking is not trafficking law, at least it's not the solution. But okay, I will go to another round of questions. We have various questions, so please uh, take notes and then you can give final answers. <laughs> the first question is about whether the government is for support uh, to Filipino migrant community. On a perspective whether you have experienced support from the Filipino government, particularly uh, with the newly established Department of Migrant Workers, whether this has uh, improved uh, the situation with greater support <coughs> from the Filipino government. Sorry. The second question is how have trade union care in Germany? So the local what have been successes and challenges for that. Uh, the second, uh, what are the challenges? Sorry, the domestic sorry, it was quite choppy. I yes, could not hear the whole question. The question is whether you have collaborated with uh, <laughs> trade unions. Mm and what have been the challenge and the success. Maybe I stop here first. <laughs> okay. 
Do you want me to go? Okay, I can go first. Um, I think we we have a reintegration research where it's a participatory. Uh, it is there are being there are five domestic workers there working on this research, and they are guided by a professional uh, researcher, academic. Uh, Miss Ella Pare Davis, yeah. So, in this research, we are looking at because many of domestic workers are now in this trafficking uh, scheme of the national referral mechanism, and one reason that the government is telling us to to deny them, to reject them, that oh, yes, you're not victim of trafficking uh, because you can actually access all these services in your country in the Philippines so and um, they being uh, denied to be able to pass into the conclusive ground decision which is the final stage of this NRM yeah and uh, so we decided to to do a research and because we needed an evidence that will prove the UK government wrong so and then so we talked to Ms. Ella Pari to, to help us with what we want to, to, to do. And, and we've been working on this since the pandemic actually. Yeah. And we found that uh, in the 24 domestic workers, means they, they are domestic workers who went home for good. For many various reasons, they could be arrested and deported. Yeah, some of them are coming here in the UK and some of them uh, made decision to go home. Some of them uh, were sick and couldn't work, so they were forced to go home. So they came to, they told us that they seek help from the government, but they didn't manage to access help and support. And I think it was also very sad that one of them already passed away waiting for this support, yeah. And I think also uh, the many of domestic workers, are, when we say, by the way, when we say support, these are financial support, these are uh, counseling, or, or reintegration, I mean, in terms of, uh, uh, I think maybe support for them to be able to have job, to have a business, a small business to start up. So th these are the support that I'm talking, which actually in the UK, they are receiving uh, now the, 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 if they are in the end, they're receiving 70.14 every week. Uh, once they are, they pass the national referral, because they will receive that every week, that financial. They also have access to counseling. However, it's not that good. <laughs> really available so that's why the most of the voice of domestic workers is providing this one-to-one -one counseling you know many of the domestic workers of our members have been through trauma stress they've been abused physically mentally tortured yeah so the importance the counseling is really important and um and also uh we also during that research we had to provide them counseling so counseling the counselor is here in the UK and they are in the Philippines so it was hard. so we provide money so that they could have the sim or the internet yeah the, we call that in the UK wi-fi I'm not sure in the Philippines but we call that wi-fi internet connection yeah so we had to provide to be able to to counsel them because they, they are in severe trauma, so they are very stressed and um, traumatized yeah, of what happened to them, but also they're facing severe poverty, difficult life in the Philippines, so it doesn't really help. So, so, um, so that, that's, that's also the domestic workers that we are rescuing here in the UK from abusive people coming from different countries, where we come Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, some of them are coming from Kenya, an African country, Nigeria, but also majority of them are coming from Saudi Arabia, so the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So we know the fact that there is very limited, you know, that they could access the Philippine uh, embassy 
and uh, also because they are luck in their private household, but also uh, they actually don't know where to seek help. I think it's really important that the Philippine government provide this that no, no, they sh where, where they should seek help, you know. I th but I think what I can say in my experience way back, I'm, I'm attending a seminar is uh, what being told is uh, where to remit money. <laughs> yeah bank accounts or all this kind of businesses, you know, that they gonna uh, use the domestic workers to kind of uh, boom their own businesses. Yeah, but not really, it's about uh, rights. It's not about that country where they should be helping. So, and I think in the UK, we're quite fortunate, you know, because uh, the, the Philippine embassy, the Polo Owa, they, they usually come, we're inviting them to come to the community to make sure that members are members of OWA because you know, in the law, you need to be a member of OWA, then you can, they can, you can access the benefits and support that you need. Sometimes you need it to go home and then you could, I think you have easy access to Polo OWA if you are a member of OWA. But the question is also, I think, which is, I think I really want to talk to this government about. Why is that? Like, they've been paying for many years of this Polo I mean, They never use it. And then one time they were out of membership and then suddenly they barely say it and they needed it. And, and that the faculty says they couldn't access it because they're no longer a member. So it's like a contractor that you're only a hero. You're only a, they call us hero. But are we really a hero? Are we really treated like a hero? Or you, we are only a hero because you, 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 you acknowledge that because of the remittances, uh, the economy of the Philippines is, uh, you know, is, yeah, is working because of this OFW remittances. And but what also we want is when you call us hero is you 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 provide that to through to to services not only the time that we could remit money but when the time that we needed that services well, that's almost especially the reintegration in our own country we've been out you know I, I go home in home and I feel like I'm an immigrant you know so I feel like I couldn't survive anymore yeah that feeling of being welcome not just because we have money we have remittances but also the feeling of that you will be there at the time when when times are hard you know and and in here we with the, the polo over is providing a livelihood pro program yeah so they they're providing some courses so for so that when they go home they ha they have knowledge and and skills to be able to to start up their own businesses and and so financial we, although we're providing here in the in the voice of the domestic workers how important it is to manage their own money that they just don't, when they receive the salary, it will go. And how important also that they, they, they take care of themselves because taking care of themselves is actually taking care of their family. So, yeah, so, yeah. so hmm. what's the, is the other question? Yes, the other question was about trade unions. So do okay. you work together with trade union in the UK? And what okay. is, has been the experience? Yeah. If you can give we, it we, yeah, we actually started in United Union. So I was standing in front of the United Union the time that I was so distressed. I was just escaped from abusive employment. And I look up at this, what the trade union could do for me as an individual worker. I think trade union to many is a kind of easy to organize workers because they are in one company. Yeah? But for domestic workers who are working individually, it's really hard, you know, it's organizing them that the fact that the voice of the domestic workers is able to organize ourselves, you know, in, in the situation and how the domestic workers are committed in this organization, in this chapter, that this is actually their own, own charity. That, that they have a bigger platform, they have bigger voice, but also the importance for us to, to have the place where in Unite the Union open the building for us where we're doing our classes every Sunday, we're meeting, we're eating together, sharing together. Also they come if we want them to invite them to, to come and talk about trade unions, but also we make sure that domestic workers are members of Unite the Union so they could access uh, whatever benefits that Unite the Union is 
for bedding. But also, uh, not only that, the, the uh, United the Union uh, also campaign with us for our rights. And also, they are actually our backdoor to Labour Party, you know, so it's that backdoor and front door. So, so to, to make sure that domestic workers' rights are in the labor manifesto or in the in the manifesto of labor party. So whenever, you know, anytime from now we can see maybe anytime, you never know, a labor party will be in power. Yeah, as you know, this government, we, we have had how many min, uh, prime minister in a year three, which is, yeah, which is, I think, showing us that this government will soon be over. So I think we see the Labour Party will be the next government. So we're kind of in, in a position to, if ever, the so government. So this is an optimistic yeah. view of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so <laughs> also, I, yeah. Okay. I, okay, now let's go to Germany. And uh, so for the same questions, uh, as well as there is one additional question uh, about the, in 2013, Gem Germany ratified the ILO Domestic Workers Convention. Has this made any difference on the ground, if you are aware of that? It's the ILO Domestic Workers uh, Convention. Germany has ratified that in 2013 but it's not sure you have seen any difference. <laughs> but anyway, let's go to the other two questions first. Oh, thank you. Okay, um, we, uh, Banning is an NGO and we get financed by the Berlin Senate directly. Uh, but then with the Philippine government, we, uh, we do once in a while collaborations with the Philippine embassy. For example, the information session. So we gather together, we give the, we, the resource person come, comes from Banyin, and so we, we do things like that for information for Filipinas. For example, about um, residence permit, marriage, divorce, and things like that. And then the, the last one was also this uh, art exhibit that I did at the Philippine Embassy during the International Women's Month. Then uh, sometimes uh, they also, we also forward some clients to them, especially when the woman calling us for help is outside of Berlin because usually the Philippine embassy has the capacity, for example, to pick up a person who needs help, who was left somewhere else, for example, in a refugee center. So things like that, we also exchange contacts. For example, when a Filipina comes to the Philippine embassy and they want some, they need some support, they also forward the, this woman to us for counseling. So it's just exchange of support for the, Filipinas, but not directly just between the Philippine Embassy and the Banyan. And we don't have trade union collaborations. And then the other question, the ILO domestic workers, uh, we are not really sure about it because with Banyan, we deal with the household workers of diplomats. So I'm not sure if it's exactly connected with these domestic workers, um, what you were asking about 2013. And these uh, the household workers of diplomats, they are under the foreign affairs. So they have a different um, process. They have different, um, what do you call this? Um, it's different with, uh, with, with their residence permits and other um, work related, um, policies for them. For like what I mentioned before, this protocol ID is completely different with other visas. It's only because they are household workers of diplomats and they cannot go to other household workers uh, because they are not allowed. But we had an, uh, we had one case where she was exempted. She is allowed because she was um, abused and she was exploited at work. So the foreign affairs allowed her to look for another family but it should be a diplomatic family. So like what you asked before uh, for domestic workers, 2013, I'm not really sure because I only work with Banning since 2017, but you can email us to, that you can find from the Banning um, website. If you, if I'm, I, I'm not sure if our other colleagues can answer you. Yeah, uh, we have shared, uh, I mean, uh, participant has shared the convention just uh, this to to take knowledge of this but clearly maybe there has not been that 
much change that you have noticed. But uh, the other question was about union, uh, whether you have worked, uh, your, your organization or other organization have worked together with unions and what has been the experience uh, so far with labor so, unions? Um, yeah, labor unions, not really. And for example, especially in my position at the Banning, uh, the, the one who is uh, collaborating with other organizations is our project coordinator. And uh, most of our collaborations, most of our network organizations are also NGOs Ber based in Berlin and in Germany and in Europe, uh, but with labor unions, not really. Okay, so maybe a last uh, question is about, again, from uh, participant, what are the challenge domestic worker or migrant worker face to reintegrate in their country of origin if they want to go back? So this is about a domestic worker or other woman worker who go back or decide to go back to the Philippines. What are the challenges that they experience? Uh, just short answer because we are at the end of our uh, event. Please, uh, let's say Marisa and then uh, Crisanta. I think my migration became permanent. <laughs> yeah, so which I never expected. Like I managed to bring my children here. So they are now living with me. So those little children who were crying, you know, it was uh, 17 years of separation. Uh, before I managed to, to bring them here in the UK and they're now here. And uh, I think in for me, I think somehow, somewhere, I find it really very hard to, to integrate in, in my own country that I feel like I became an immigrant in my own country already. But uh, I, we prepared our members because they don't really have that uh, security right now, the way the policy that we have here and the, the work condition is not really stable and uh, very it's very unsecured. So anytime they could uh, be arrested and deported, yeah. And or they may not succeed in getting their rights through the trafficking scheme that they are in at the moment. So it's very uh, unsecure. So we we prepared them, and that is why we we, we were working very closely with uh, Polo Owa, yeah, to to provide this uh the, this uh um training yeah for them to to be able. We know that they will face uh you know, the, the age discrimination, yeah, because they are already ages have been working here for 10 years, uh, 20 years, and then going back to your own country. And the important for them to really uh, prepare financially, you know, that's why we have financial uh, literacy class, you know, to, to help them, like they should save some of their money and not all send to their money. And, and today everybody is smiling at you, but when you have no money, well, they smile at you. So, so going home, I think uh, is is like the, this country is very hot. And it's very cold, yeah, it's cold. And going back to a hot country, and I find it really difficult to breathe in the Philippines because of that. And I, but I think I love the fresh air. I love that. I always want to be there, but not really for, for permanent living there. So I would, I think three quarter of my life was out of the UK or uh, out of the country already and going back there. Yes, I have family, but... I'm hoping uh, I can just go there and, and visit them. But I think what would they prepare with the medical, you know, did they prepare for this, uh, you know, SSS? Did they continue doing that so they have some uh, pension when they go home? And then also, uh, I think uh, that the separation that they had, again, for their family, I think, like my children, 17 years of, of, of separation was hard for me to kind of feel each other, you know, 
uh, shoulder, well, the, the separation that we've been through and, and, and facing each other on how they kind of treat people. And for them, I'm a financial, I'm not really their mother, their mother is my sister. And I have to accept that. And the fact that my sister has treated them like her own children uh, make me happy. And I think we just look forward for our future together here and then how I supported them now that they are mothers, they are my 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 son has a son already. Now I'm have four grandchildren and I'm helping them to to build their life, you know, to have their careers. I'm become also a nanny by my my own grandchildren, which allow my children to and that's the contribution of domestic workers, allowing others to be able to build their career, to build their businesses, to build the, to be able to work. And uh going home to a country where help we have was that really an improvement? Because I think my permanent uh, migration has something to do with the economy. Because I did try to go back so I could look after my children. I know they're growing, how much they need their mother, you know, to be in the side. For me to be able to work at the same time, look after them, but I was not be able. I failed when I tried to do that. I had forced to go back again, you know to go back again because I, I could see, you know, that I had to work almost 24 hours and I didn't see, I was there physically, but I go home, my children were sleeping. I had to leave very early, my, my children were sleeping. So there's no physical contact communication that me being there, but I, I have to work and to live again because we're suffering. We're, 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 we're not, and I didn't manage to kind of build the life that I want, the dream that I wanted in a short migration. You know, that was I, I live again and then become permanent. So have the government really work on to start this you migration? Managed. Yeah, so yeah. So yes, you have managed to find the solution at the end, but yeah, the challenge of reintegration includes reintegrating and uniting again with your family. But maybe Chrisanta, can you say a few last words about the mm -hmm. challenge uh, of reintegration and uh, what is being done to prepare uh, I don't know your organization, whether editing uh, is being done to prepare them to return uh, to the Philippines for those who need to return or want to return. Okay, uh, at Banning, we don't really get uh, help clients to go back. So we are supporting women who are living in Germany, but we have some uh, already who came to us asking for help, but it's usually there's this uh, organization called IOM and they support them to go back there, or sometimes also the embassy. But uh, from what I recognize, the main problem is also financial. That's why some just stay here or just come back afterwards. Because for example, most women who did not really work a lot or earn a lot, they don't have pension at old age. So in Germany, they can get this, um, uh, this basic security financial support. But if they go back to the Philippines, there's nothing like that, no pension. And even if they have a little pension, that's also another challenge. How do they get this pension there in the Philippines? And there are also a lot of other requirements. And aside from that, it's also difficult for them, especially if they still want to work because most women, even at old age, they still work so they can still earn money and then they can still send it back to the Philippines. And if they go back to the Philippines, there is nothing at all to earn money, like what Marisa said, because of the age limit that they cannot work anywhere else because they are older. And like what I said at Banyang, we don't really have clients who, want, who intend to go back. Most of them really stay here, even when it's really hard for them or even when they are really exploited, being exploited because of financial capacity here compared to the Philippines. That's all actually I can see. Thank you very much uh, to both of you. I think you have uh, together given a very uh, complete, uh, complete comprehensive uh, overview of uh, the situation for migrant women, in particular for the UK of domestic uh, worker and the resilience of this uh, woman that 
really in an environment that maybe is becoming even more restrictive in terms of laws and in terms of discrimination and many other challenges, they remain and fight for uh, the support of their own life as well as the family of their own uh, family. So I think this is uh, the first uh, event of a series of two that we are focusing on the Philippines. I think this one was really on going to Europe. Maybe the next one is addressing the issue of reintegration uh, for women who came back from Europe to the Philippines. Although, as you say, many remain uh, in Europe because of the financial condition uh, in Europe as compared to the, the condition in the Philippines, as well as many establish a new life uh, with uh, maybe spouses or uh, even reunited in Europe. So there is really no more the drive to go back uh, to the Philippines. But the next, anyway, we will try to give uh, highlight uh, the challenges and uh, benefits if there are of going back uh, to the Philippines as seen from the experience of the of the women themselves. This will be one month uh, time. In the meantime, on the 26th, uh, for those in Bangkok, we will be discussing African migration. Uh, so a different topic, but still related to uh, migration is an aspect of migration to Thailand, which is often neglected because it's a small uh, minority of, of migrants coming to, that will be on-site event as well as online. Uh, so please uh, do continue for people interested in migration, please do continue to follow us. And uh, thank you again uh, to our uh, two speakers uh, for their contribution uh, to this uh, series. And thank you to the Global Alliance Against Trafficking of Women for supporting uh, some of this organization and the research uh, that they have done as well as this event in the series. So thank you again for your time and thank you to all the participants. And sorry for my coughing <laughs> just a little while ago. I think it was dry. It's very hot in Thailand as at the moment. This is the excuse. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. No problem. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you very much. Bye-bye.